My name is Daniela Lurion. I'm Topher Humanity Director and part of the Education Department here at the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies. As we're getting ourselves started, I'll take a few moments to please remind everyone to please keep their videos off and their mics muted. The presentation is being recorded and will be available later on this week. I also want to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the land that we are on. While we do today meet virtually, Please do take a moment to consider the importance of the lands and waters that feed our bodies and souls. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral lands and territories of all the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people who call this land home. I am so proud to be joined today by our very special guest speaker, FSWC's own senior educator, Elena Kingsbury. Elena has been here at FSWC for the last five years and has taught thousands of students across Ontario and beyond through our workshops. She loves to teach students of all backgrounds and abilities and has helped develop many of our workshops and programs, including Freedom Day, Speakers Idol, and our National Policy Conference on Holocaust Education. Her love of history and curiosity about the wider world began at a very early age. As a child, the majority of Jewish people she knew were survivors like her maternal grandparents, who escaped Prague for Denmark in 1939. This personal connection started Elena on an academic path which would lead her to Montreal and McGill, where she completed her MA in history in 2014. She's here today to share her grandparents' story of rescue and survival. Elena, thank you so much. We're all looking very much forward to hearing from you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Daniela. Um, and, you know, I hope uh, it's it's probably obvious, but I will say it off the bat that it's a huge honor um, to be occupying this space particularly when we've had so many incredible speakers sharing testimony relating to the Holocaust and you know other crimes like last week we had Gerardine with uh, the Rwandan genocide. Um, and today I'm you know I'm here to share my own family's uh, personal journey during during the Second World War, um, which is a different kind of responsibility. Obviously I, I'm used to speaking through the center. Um, I've taught thousands of students. Um, about the Holocaust and other crimes in history. And I have the honor to work with a lot of our, our survivor speakers that do speak through the center regularly. Um, so I really don't take this responsibility lightly at all. But without further ado, let me share my slides because as Daniela mentioned in her introduction, my, uh, my testimony today will focus on the experiences of my grandparents who were both Czech teenagers um, who escaped from Prague to Denmark in 1939. Uh, they both also journeyed from Denmark to Sweden uh, during the rescue of, of the Danish Jewish population in 1943. Um, and I'm gonna be also you know, talking a little bit more about the extended family, about my great grandparents um, and their fates during the Holocaust and you know, the tragedy that, that befell uh, both sides of, of my maternal grandparents, families. And just, just off the bat, these, th this is a photo. Um, it's a very, I find, evocative photo. Um, it's a photo of my grandparents and a few of the other Jewish tech, Czech teens that um, were in, in Denmark. And specifically, this was a group that was in the community um, or kind of in the countryside around the town of Nastved. Um, and both my grandparents are, are in this image, um, you know, not the typical image that we see of, uh, you know, Jewish people in Europe during the Holocaust. Um, and certainly, you know, they were living in a country occupied by, by the Nazis when we talk about Denmark um, being occupied by, by Nazi Germany. Um, I believe it was December of, of 19, or sorry, late 1940 when that invasion took place. But in any case, um, you know, this is a very, under understudied or not very well known aspect of the Holocaust. Um, my grandparents were a part of a very small group. It was about 150 Czech teenagers um, that were able to, to escape to Denmark, um, which as I'm sure we understand is, you know, a very, very small number. Uh, when, when millions of others perished, this was a very lucky group of young people. Um, and here's a little bit of a, a better introduction to my grandparents. Um, in Canada, they, they always you know, went by the names Anne and Charles Steiner, but uh, when, they, when they always spoke to each other and talked especially about their own history, um, the names they always went by were Nemka and Kayo, and my, my grandfather's name being 
Carl, so it's sort of a, I believe, a you know, diminutive. Um, and this, these two photos, uh, I believe, were both taken um, during their time in Denmark, certainly during the, the Second World War period, um, probably when they were both, you know, maybe roughly 16, 17 years old. And, uh, you know, this is sort of, you know, I think a really special age in terms of, you know, a lot of the, the memories that they had, you know, this is a time when a lot of us, we really are making memories and we are thinking, um, you know, about the wider world. And so, you know, I often think about the fact that my grandparents went through this journey, you know, during a very formative time of life. Um, they were 13 and 14 years old, respectively, when Prague was invaded by, uh, by Germany in, uh, in uh, I believe, March of 1939. Uh, the Sudetenlands had already been taken at that point. Um, but, you know, as, as very young teenagers, um, you know, certainly those memories of the invasion were very strong for them both. One thing that I will also say as, as I'm getting into my testimony is tragically, I, I didn't have a lot of opportunity to speak with my grandparents directly about their, their memories and their experiences. Um, I was very close with them both. Um, my grandmother is actually still living. She's 97 today, but they weren't really, you know, like many survivors, they didn't speak um, very openly about, about their experiences, um, especially, you know, a little bit later on, um, especially my grandmother began sharing more, but when I was a child, this really wasn't something that was discussed. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, as, as we'll move along, hopefully it will also make sense why it might've been difficult, um, even though, you know, they were in many ways exceptionally lucky, um, you know, they also had a lot of guilt and a lot of feelings, you know, probably around the fates of, of of their parents and other family members. Um, but I will also, just to borrow a little bit of wisdom from one of our, our survivor speak speakers, um, Andy, who I might be on this call right now, but something that Andy always says, and I think it definitely resonates for my family, is that each survivor story is a love story. And, you know, when I, I learn about what my grandparents went through and, you know, how their parents responded to what was going on, that, that sentiment is very, very true for, for my own family as well. So Andy, I'm gonna borrow that from you. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I'd also like to take this time to introduce you to my great grandparents. Um, and one of the reasons that I felt compelled to share my testimony, aside from the fact that I, I do believe, you know, that this is a story that deserves to be heard, um, is the incredible wealth of documentary evidence that my family is lucky to have. Um, even though I didn't hear a lot of direct testimony from, from my grandparents, we have many, many photo albums, um, you know, of life before, before the war, a lot of different documents relating to, to the, you know, the Holocaust itself, um, and, a, and a huge amount of documents um, from, from the post-war era. And so, you know, it's, it's sort of, it really comes to life, I think. And, you know, I, I have a lot of photos that I haven't shared and it took me a long time to decide what photos I should, should select. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, an ongoing project for me and really discovering this family history. But in any case, I'd like to introduce you to my, my, uh, my grandmother's mother, my great grandmother, Marianna Hirsch Federer, um, born in 1890. And, she was really an incredible woman, um, a, apparently extremely independent. Um, in, her in, in her 20s, she became a master tailor and she was actually, uh, you know, kind of a, a high fashion seamstress. She opened her own salon, uh, rented an apartment in the city of Prague as a young woman and apparently had five other women working under her and they were creating, um, you know, beautiful, you know, fashion and I, I believe for, you know, aristocrats and kind of more, more, uh, you know, high, high, uh, high class clientele, we might say. Um, and it wasn't until she was 34 years old that she met and married my, my great grandfather. Um, but his name, Max or Maximilian Federer, um, he was born in 1882. 
um, not in Prague, but in a nearby village where uh, his family has very deep roots going back to at least the 1700s, um, Lyushke Yonovitsa, which I don't know much about it, but I, I know that it's, it's a village um, outside of Prague. And uh, Max was actually uh, a, a chemist. He, was, uh, he got his PhD in chemistry um, in Germany. Um, and I will say that particularly um, my, my grandmother's parents were very assimilated. They really fit that, you know, sort of, um, you know, stereotype of the, you know, the assimilated uh, Jewish uh, couple. They weren't particularly religious. And, uh, you know, when we look, when I look through their photos, you know, they're incredibly modern looking and very, uh, you know, just sort of, it's, it's an interesting window into this time period and into, uh, you know, a particular, uh, Oh, and I got one question here that I, I thought I might get. So, and this is something my grandmother always speculated that yes, perhaps we are related to Roger Federer. I have no evidence that that's the case, um, but you never know, it's not the most common name, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, so this photo on the left side here, this is a photo of, of my great grandfather as a young man, um, clearly you know, in, a, in a, a chemistry lab. I'm not sure if, if this was his lab, but he actually was uh, also an inventor. Um, and so his career took him to creating his own lab where they were producing um, a couple of chemicals that he invented. My grandmother told me that these, they were basically, um, there was one that was like a sealant for roofs uh, and another sealant for like asphalt. So, you know, some kind of weatherproofing uh, chemicals. And there was a small lab that, that that he, uh, you know, managed um, outside of outside of Prague, uh, and this, this is where my grandmother also spent a lot of her childhood, kind of between the city and the village of Uvali. And here is my my uh, my great grandparents. That I believe this is, you know, maybe their engagement or or, or wedding portrait, um, taken in 1924. This was the same year that they met, and they met through fairly unique circumstances. Um, my my grandfather put an ad in a newspaper for looking for uh, you know a female companion, and my grandmother. Um, so he was already I believe in his forties at that point, his early forties, and my grandmother, who was you know a, a very independent woman, um, you know had this studio where where she was uh, you know producing clothing, but she saw the ad, and she decided to respond, and so she met. Max, they met, uh, I guess, at a cafe, and she wore a rose to, you know, to mark who she was, um, and they hit it off. And I guess about a month later, they married. Um, but in another, just another interesting detail, when they were meeting at this cafe, my grandmother, uh, or my great grandmother, I was, I'm sorry, um, had a, a friend slash, you know, a woman who worked for her. Uh, her name is Annie, and she's very important to our families, you know, the re even the fact that I have these photos, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But she came with my my great grandmother to the cafe and sort of sat nearby and like, you know, hid to make sure that, you know, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing dangerous happened. So, but the meeting went well. And the next year, May 4th, my grandmother was born. And here are a few photos of her, um, you know, obviously, when she was a very young baby on on the, the left side there. Um, a portrait of her a few years later. She was an only child. Um, and when, you, when I look through her, her photos, and as I said, we actually have, we have several photo albums of, of their family life before the war. Um, you know, you really get a sense of the privilege that she was born into, as well as um, the immense love of her parents for her. And, you know, you really get a sense as well of their life and you know just the objects that surround them in, in their day to day life. On the right side, this is a picture of, of my grandmother with a cousin named Emily, or that was that was the name that my my grandmother provided. Um, and really, there's there's no shortage of these images and you know they I love to look at them I can look at them endlessly. Um, but you really, you know, kind of get a sense of their family life. And this is an image, uh, I believe, when they were in that that uh, the sort of the country area where where uh, my great grandfather had his lab. Um, 
and here we have on the uh, on the right side, this is an image of my grandmother with Annie, the woman who, um, you know, she's she, as far as my grandmother always described her, um, she was an incredible person. She was, you know, a lifelong friend of my great grandmother, even though she was also her employee. Um, and she was also basically, uh, you know, like a, a nurse to my grandmother. So she was, you know, housekeeper or, you know, uh, you know, sort of filling those different roles, but had a very, very close relationship with the whole family. And, you know, my grandmother has extremely fond memories of her. So this is an image, um, I believe this was taken on a, a skiing trip at, you know, one of those ski resorts, I think called Spindler Mule um, near the Polish Czech border. But I love sort of this, you know, the, the look on her face, she sort of looks like this stern Czech woman, um, but she's also got a little smile on and my grandmother, looks like she's quite happy there. So you get a sense of, uh, you know, that dynamic as well. My grandmother on, on the left side, just to quickly mention, you know, I mentioned, you know, a life of, of, uh, of privilege. She also really was, um, you know, very modern in terms of being very athletic. She was a really skilled figure skater as a child. And this is an image, her mother's actually in the background there watching her. Um, but my grandmother always loved to skate and, you know, even certainly when I was a child, I, I remember skating with her a lot. Um, but this love was definitely born, um, you know, in, in her pre-war life. And, you know, not only are there a lot of photos that we have of, uh, of the family, but even, uh, so Bibi was the name of, of the family's Dash, uh, Dachshund. And this is a, you know, a dog that my Nana spoke very fondly of. And it is kind of one of those tragic, um, you know, details during the Holocaust. And sometimes people hear about this, not not always directly, um, the fact that, you know, Jewish pets were rounded up and, and confiscated, um, not only in Germany, but also in, you know, occupied territories, including uh, Czechoslovakia. So I know that my grandmother eventually got a letter from her parents when she had already escaped to Denmark that, that the, that Bibi had been taken. And I'm not actually sure what the fate of Bibi was, whether, you know, taken to the Humane Society or a, maybe, you know, another family took him in or perhaps, you know, destroyed. My grandfather, so the Steiner family, um, I have a little bit less knowledge about and certainly fewer photographs, but still, um, you know, we're still very lucky that we do have many photographs um, that help us understand their life as well. But um, Hermina and, and Rudolf Steiner were my, my, my grandfather's parents. Um, and they actually owned a, a violin store in Prague. Um, I believe, from my understanding, it was a store that sold violins that were um, sort of like practice violins for students. So not sort of like really high quality instruments, but sort of a, you know, a, a more like for, for educational purposes. Um, and my grandfather, you know, he was a, a lifelong violin player, although eventually he gave it up apparently because the cat that they had at the time hated the sound of him playing. Nonetheless, um, and this is a photo of, this is the earliest photo that I have of my grandfather. He's the, the little guy in the middle wearing the sailor suit. Um, his older brother, Yerka, is, is pictured on, on the left side. And I'm not sure the identity of the other child, maybe a cousin or, or a neighbor. Um, and he was born the year before my grandmother, so in, in June of 1924. <clears throat> and uh, we're, again, we are very lucky. We, ha we have images and, and you get a little bit of a sense of the family dynamic here. So my grandfather is the child on, on the left side holding his mother's hand. Um, and he was probably about six years old in this photo. And finally, uh, this is this is the last family photo that I have of of my grandfather's family. Um, I believe it was taken shortly before he left for Denmark. Um, I'm not sure the context that it was taken, but perhaps it was even taken in preparation for that that separation. Um, but so my grandfather is is on the left side again beside his father, and uh, his brother Yerka is is pictured on on the right side. And so. This brings me to 
where my grandparents' story sort of begins to intersect. Um, they were both teenagers, you know, and they, they, their families weren't friends. They didn't know each other well, but they were both a part of Jewish youth, move, the Jewish youth movements that were um, prevalent in Prague at this time, um, including the movement that eventually they, they both were a part of that allowed them to escape to Denmark. And this was um, the Youth Aliyah movement that sort of, it was an international movement um, but they opened a Prague school in, I believe it was early 1939 to respond to the removal of Jewish students from the public system. And so they were providing education to Jewish students. Um, but over time, another, another goal emerged and they, they sort of developed this program where Jewish youth between the ages of 14 and 16 were to be trained um, and taken abroad uh, to eventually settle in, in Palestine to, you know, to become pioneers um, in, in the new Jewish homeland. And this is really the only reason that my grandparents survived. Um, Denmark agreed to take in a small number, about 150 Czech teenagers for, uh, for pioneer training, for agriculture work, basically that these, these young people would be placed on different farms and would not be there permanently. So it wasn't that Denmark was accepting a large number of Jewish refugees. It was sort of, uh, it was a transitional, uh, you know, role that Denmark was agreeing to play. Um, and so another, another really incredible uh, series of photographs that I have um, are images of the Jewish youth camp that was sort of organized to help prepare students um, for this journey. And so my grandparents were both, um, and I'm not actually sure exactly like how it was organized because I think they probably kept, you know, the boys and the girls separate, or at least these are all images showing, um, you know, young men. Uh, and I believe in the low, in the, in the photo with the canoes here, I, I think that my grandfather is actually in the first canoe on the left side, wearing the little, the little cap. Uh, but there's, you know, you kind of get a sense of, you know, these young, young teenage uh, you know, Jews that were preparing for uh, an adventure. And you know, the images really, they look like they could be summer camp um, you know, from, from anywhere or any time. But there are also a lot of kind of, when you look at the pictures a little bit deeper, you do start to understand that there is kind of this bigger mission. So one of the figures that was a key, key organizer um, of the Aliyah movement in, in Prague was Egon uh, Redlich. And he was uh, someone who ultimately became really important in Theresienstadt. Um, he was the head of the Department for Children and Youth in the camp, um, but he was actually a key organizer of this transport of, of Czech teenagers to, to Denmark. Um, and my grandmother spoke very highly of him and, and knew him personally. So, you know, there are certain sort of aspects of these photos that do show us, you know, it wasn't just a, a fun, uh, you know, moment or, or opportunity to get away. Um, this was all, you know, when, when, uh, when Czechoslovakia was already occupied and when, uh, you know, World War II was sort of imminent. And so, you know, it was a very conscious effort to provide, you know, both um, physical training, but also spiritual training. And, you know, these students were uh, being taught Hebrew, they were being taught kind of, you know, cultural um, appreciation, as well as, you know, doing things that were more like traditional camp or scouting activities. <clears throat> And so this is an image of uh, one of the groups of Czech Jewish teenagers. And again, my grandparents are identified here. Um, and they, they left uh, Prague um, after World War II had already begun um, in, I believe it was November of 1939. There were kind of a, a few different train transports uh, taking groups of roughly 50 Czech teenagers to Denmark um, in, I believe it was October and, and November of, of 1939. So this is where, uh, where this image comes from. Um, and, you know, I think a little bit about, you know, what, what these teenagers 
you know, they, they didn't know what was coming and they certainly didn't know the full extent of what was to come for those, you know, left behind. Um, but I'm sure this was a, a, a time of ex excitement, anxiety. Um, I know my grandmother, you know, she spoke, she spoke very candidly with me about how upsetting it was for her parents, um, especially her mother um, cried every day for weeks in the lead up to my grandmother leaving. Um, they, they did not want her to go. Um, but my great grandfather said, it's the situation is like getting out of a burning house. So whatever needs to happen needs to happen. And so he kind of made the final decision. Um, but, you know, you kind of think a little bit about that difficulty of, you know, for Jewish parents, you know, trying to predict what is what is going to happen and what is the right decision. Should I keep my children close? Should I send them away to an unknown location? That's a very difficult decision to make. But I think when I look at the images um, of what life was like for my grandparents in Denmark, I think, and, and in light of everything I know about the fate of the majority of, you know, people in their community, uh, it was an incredible decision. And it was, you know, it's the decision that, you know, arguably is why I'm even here talking to you today. Um, the images are, you know, very, uh, they're often very sort of cheery. They look, they're images that show adventure. Um, the, the image of the young woman sticking her tongue out, that was a good friend of my grandmother's um, in Denmark. Um, and, you know, you, you do get a sense of real camaraderie. And if you think about kind of what it would be like to be, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, all of a sudden you're removed from your, your family, you're on your own. Um, and, you know, you're, it, it must have been an exciting time. Having said that, you know, there was a lot of concern and a lot of fear about what was going on at home. Also a lot of concern and fear once Denmark itself was occupied by Germany. Um, and certainly, you know, the fate of, of this group was no by, you know, by no means secure. Um, in light of how, you know, especially what we know about um, the Nazis persecution of Dutch Jews or Jews in a lot of other countries, even in Western Europe. But, you know, Denmark really was the lucky place to be in many ways. And uh, here are just a few images as well. So these are images from my grandfather's collection. And uh, he was, um, <clears throat> I believe, not maybe as lucky as my grandmother in the sense that he was first placed on a farm where I, he had a negative experience and I'm not really sure what that was, if it was, you know, anti-Semitism or something entirely different. Um, but he was uh, then, he then went to a second farm um, and, you know, I believe he, you know, he had a good experience for the most part. Um, you can kind of get a sense of his life a little bit from some of these images. Um, so, and he was, he was on a farm in, uh, or near, near Nastved, which again was the sort of town center where not all of the Czech Jewish teenagers were in that region, but that was sort of one center where there were a number of them in surrounding communities. But my grandmother, you know, was, was in a very special position um, in Denmark in the sense that she was actually not placed on a farm like the majority of other teenagers. She was placed with uh, an older couple in the town of Mastved. Um, they were, they seem like a fascinating couple and I, I, I wish I actually knew their first names and I don't remember. Uh, I, it's something that I'm still working on uncovering, um, but basically they were an older couple uh, they were both musicians. Um, I believe my grandmother said in a supper club, Mrs. Sauer played the piano and her husband played the trumpet. Um, and they were incredibly good to my grandmother. They, they treated her like, a, like their, their, their daughter, or um, I know that she called them aunt and uncle. Um, and, you know, she, she was working um, in a children's home and kind of working um, with groups of children in different capacities. Uh, so she was, you know, all of the Czech teenagers in Denmark were given various roles and jobs, um, but hers was, you know, a little bit less related to farming. 
Uh, and I, I love these pictures, um, you know, especially the, uh, you know, this picture with these dogs, they look kind of like some kind of demons, but, um, you know, it's, it's to me very important that we have images of, of the Sars. And, uh, you know, I know for my grandmother, up until very recently, she actually had uh, two portraits always right by her. And they, one was her, of her biological parents, Max and Mariana Federer, but the other two portraits were of, of the Sours. And she always had, you know, a lot of love for them. And I know that they, they were in touch corresponding um, for the rest of their lives. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not actually sure though when they passed away and, and that is something I wanna learn more about as, as soon as I can. But <clears throat> one of the probably most important and I think unique documents um, that my family has relating to the history of the Holocaust is this scrapbook um, that was actually created either by or for my great grandparents, my, my grandmother's parents, um, and cre the, created by a cousin who was staying with them once my grandmother had already escaped. So we, we have this scrapbook um, and it's basically, uh, it preserves all of the letters that my grandmother wrote and sent back home from her time in Denmark. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a red leather bound scrapbook. It sort of has this brown parchment over top and it says Nemke in large letters. Um, and this is the first page. So it has sort of some portraits of, that were taken of my grandmother right before she began her journey. And it says November, 1939. And I'll just show you a few examples. It's, it's actually, it's really an exceptional document and it's something that I have not, you know, we're, we really need to do a lot more research into. Um, and, you know, it's also a delicate document. So that's another aspect of this. Um, but fairly recently, we took control of, of all of my grandmother's old papers and documents and, and this scrapbook was a part of it. So not only do we have letters um, that are carefully scrapbooked and kept in their envelopes, um, I believe there's like maybe roughly 20 to 30 letters in total. Um, and they're all put in the scrapbook, but my grandmother's cousin who was staying with them at the time then illustrated each of the envelopes um, based on the contents of the letter. So kind of, you know, creating an illustration to go along with whatever the message was. Um, and it's, to me, that's, you know, it's, it's very, I also love to draw myself. So I find that very, very fascinating on, on different levels. Um, this is the first letter in the scrapbook and it says Warrenmund, which was the, the German port city that the train traveled from Prague Warrenland and then from there, the teenagers were transported to, uh, to Zealand or to, to Denmark. And so all of the letters are, are still in these envelopes. Um, and here are a few, just a sample of some of the different illustrations um, on all of these different envelopes. I, I've, I could and have studied them for hours and I, you know, but, but really uh, I was talking earlier with, with one of my colleagues about how this really is a, a PhD project to, to examine and really explore all of these different documents and letters. The, the envelopes have also resealed themselves over time. So not wanting to damage, we, you know, we've, we've really not gotten into a lot of the envelopes, but um, they're all there. And, you know, it's, it's very, you know, I, I just love to see the sort of th these different illustrations. I know that the one on the lower right side um, I remember my grandmother telling me that that letter was about how she had gained a lot of weight in Denmark from drinking, you know, Danish dairy products and things. And so we see a little image of her, you know, on the scale. So she's, you know, gained some weight there. Um, for a very long time, I knew nothing of her cousin. I knew she had mentioned his name as Pepek, um, and I didn't know anything else about this person. Um, all I knew is that he was an older cousin. He had stayed with my great, my great grandparents for a time in Prague um, and that he had, you know, done this. He had illustrated these, these letters, you know, as a gesture to comfort them and to kind of cheer them up um, while, while going through this time. Um, but 
I actually, this is, you know, as I'm going through this, as I was preparing for this program, um, I've started to uncover things that I didn't know. And I just Googled his name, which his, his actual name was Joseph Tossig. Um, and little did I know that there was a Wikipedia page dedicated to him because he was actually a, a journalist in Prague with the youth magazine. Um, and he was deported to Theresienstadt on December 5th of 1942. And apparently he was one of the leading representatives of Czech theater and cabaret in the Theresien ghetto, uh, which I had no idea. Um, but I did know that he didn't survive the Holocaust. And now I know the exact details because this was also on his Wikipedia page. He was transported um, to Auschwitz on October 28th of 1944. Um, on the last train from Theresienstadt. And in January of 1945, he survived a death march to Flossenburg, but died there on March 10th of 1945, five weeks before the US Army liberated the camp. So, you know, there's a lot of stories like that where, you know, people, you know, even who were living right up until, you know, the very end of the war not surviving. So it, that's not so shocking, I guess. But, you know, especially when I look at this picture of him, he's such a lively looking person. He looks like such a friendly, happy person. And I think of the drawings that he did. And, you know, it's it is such a tragedy to me and really, you know, something to mourn that that during the Holocaust, there were a lot of Pepics and a lot of people who contributed a lot. And, you know, lives were destroyed simply for their Jewish identity. And Theresienstadt, this is, as, uh, as probably some of us are aware, this is, this is a camp that many uh, Czech Jews uh, spent time in, maybe for a matter of days, um, some, in some cases for years. Um, but this was a transit camp um, before Jews were usually sent further east. And so, my, all of my great grandparents, as well as my grandfather's brother, and you know many of, of you know the extended family, the aunts and uncles and cousins, virtually everyone that I've come across, um, they all they all were sent to Theresienstadt, uh, except for actually Pepek's brother, um, who was murdered by the Gestapo for being a prominent communist figure. Um, so his name was Franta Tasig, and again another Wikipedia page uh, of a relative that I, you know, had really only heard very briefly about. But uh, Theresienstadt was not the final destination um, for any of my great grandparents. My great grandparents um, on my grandfather's side, Hermina and Rudolf Steiner, uh, were both murdered at Auschwitz. Um, we don't know exactly when they're, you know, the detail available in terms of records can be somewhat varied and there are no specific records that relate to their deaths but we know that they died um, likely on arrival or you know not not too long after um, just based on things like their age um, and the fact that they had already been uh, in Theresienstadt they were actually in in that camp for uh, for over two years which you know was not the case for my great grandparents on my grandmother's side. I also will just say, so my, my, my grandfather's brother, uh, Yurka, he also was sent to Auschwitz. Um, and I believe from there, he journeyed on to another labor camp, although I don't know the identity of the camp. Um, and he, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those horrible tragedies um, of, of the Holocaust. And there was actually a project done by a Czech journalist and she called the project Sophie's Choice the Czech Way. And my grandfather's family kind of illustrates that because this, this youth program, the Zionist program that was taking these Czech teenagers to Denmark, um, the, chil the children had to be between 14 and 16 and they could only take one child per family. So I believe my, my, my grandfather's brother, he was older, so he might've already been too old um, but, you know, he wasn't able to escape through the same, same way. And so he did, uh, you know, actually survive um, Auschwitz, Theresienstadt, and I believe at least one other camp. <clears throat>
But one of the more I, I find disturbing and, you know, I haven't actually heard of any other, uh, any other people having the exact same experience. My, my great grandparents on my grandmother's side, Max and Mariana Federer, uh, they were both murdered off of a transport taken to Estonia in September of, of 1942. So they only spent uh, less than two months in Theresienstadt when they were first deported. Um, and, you know, this is actually, you know, a very, very little known um, aspect of, of the Holocaust. And there's actually a series of documentaries made, films made by a, a Czech journalist named Lucas um, Pribble. I, I hope that's pronouncing it right. Um, and so he made four films and one of them was called Forgotten Transports to Estonia. And so in that particular film, you know, it, it gets into the details of the specific transport that they were on. Um, but when you look at the map, and, it, and I also included, so the, the red county, basically, you know, it's right on the, the Baltic coast. And it, to me, it's quite disturbing to think of, you know, how they were taken to this very, you know, distant corner, you know, a village in Estonia, um, you know, they were murdered by local Estonians under the supervision of, of, of Germans. Um, and the location is, it's in this village called Yagala. And it's, uh, you know, the mass killing site was basically sand dunes, you know, near, fairly near to the coast. Um, and I actually have just a, a brief excerpt from a, a journalist, a Czech journalist um, who wrote a book about the group of teenagers um, traveling to Denmark, she actually wrote a, a, a statement here about um, my, grand, my, my great grandmother and great grandfather. So I'll just read what she wrote in this one article. I watched the film and look at the story of the transport of thousands of people, a few days in ghetto to reason and then on the train to Estonia. Just a common place, nothing special. They get off the train, they are told older people to the left, younger people to the right. The older ones are by a deep pit. There is continuous shooting and piles and piles of corpses. There is also a historical study about the transport, which is very detailed and factual. It is very difficult for me to read the first page. I think of Mariana. I think of that face. I think of a beautiful mother holding her daughter. It is hard to turn the page. Photos of uh, the piles of bodies, legs, arms. Maybe Mariana is lying there. It's not just some bones and skin. They are people, um, people who had names, dreams, and destinies. So, and the, the, the woman who wrote that, um, her name is Yudita Matyasova, and she, she did write a, as I mentioned, a book, and I'll hopefully be able to reference that, but I, I also see that my, my time is perhaps running short. So, uh, you know, I, I found it very moving that she was moved by, you know, by the fate of my great-grandmother, and, you know, after looking at photos of her, you know, I definitely, I feel the same and I, I hope that, that you do as well. Meanwhile, back in Denmark, uh, my great grand, or my grandparents, sorry, um, you know, they were living in an increasingly uh, precarious situation because although they were there, you know, theoretically, at, you know, kind of as a temporary stopover before traveling to Palestine, all of those plans were put on hold once the war broke out and the travel routes were closed down. So they were, they were in Denmark um, for just over three years, I believe. Um, but when what happened in October of 1943 is Nazi Germany decided to deport uh, the Danish Jewish population to Theresienstadt. And so there was what is often viewed as, um, you know, one of the largest acts of collective resistance um, to aggression in one of the countries occupied by Germany during the Second World War. The rescue of the Danish Jews was a massive collective effort. Um, you know, hundreds of average Danish people were involved. Uh, I know that Mrs. Sauer, my, my grandmother's, uh, you know, host was, was an organizer in their local community um, and basically, you know, made sure that that thousands of Jews um, had safe passage to Sweden. Um, and basically the main way that, that, 
that these Jews were transported was in the bottom of fishing boats across the, the Orasund, which is a fairly short passage of water between, uh, between Denmark and, and Sweden. And so this is how my grandparents survived the deportation from Denmark um, among other teenagers. The majority of the teenagers that they had begun their journey with, they were still all together up until this point, um, up until basically they, they entered Sweden and then were uh, dispersed um, among different families and kind of you know, placed in different living situations. And my grandfather, uh, among other young people in their group, but uh, I'm not sure of any of the other names, but I know my grandfather um, in 1944 enlisted with the free Czechoslovak army that was sort of a part of the, the uh, you know, the, the British military uh, and actually participated in the liberation of France. And uh, he was um, in, a, in a tank, in, I don't know exactly how, how it all worked, but he, he drove a tank by his description and uh, was you know, a very proud, very proud of his service. And you know, I think you know, it's very rare for a Jewish person who was you know, both kind of a victim and an escapee of the Nazis also had the opportunity in a sense to fight against the Nazis. And I will say that I think he was always much more uh, willing to speak about his service in the military than you know, about the fate of his family or you know, sort of the Holocaust in general. But he, uh, so he left Sweden and, and traveled to Britain um, in 1944. Meanwhile, my grandmother, uh, I believe she was, uh, she was, um, involved with, again, caring for children in a few different facilities. And I believe she also worked for a time in the home of a Swedish diplomat and sort of was caring for his children. Um, but here's an image of her. I'm not actually sure the exact context of this photo, unfortunately, but I know that it was during her time, um, I believe in, in Sweden and certainly while she was you know, on this journey to Denmark and Sweden. And they came back together again in 1945 and married when my grandfather uh, was released from the military. Um, my grandmother came back to Prague first. She actually, uh, she, when, so when, when the war ended, she first went back to Denmark and returned to the Sauer family. She lived with them for a couple of months and they wanted, to, they wanted to keep her. They would have happily uh, let her stay there with them. She said they wanted to adopt her, but she, she wanted to find her parents. She hoped that they might've survived or she wanted to find out the fate of, of everyone else in the family. And so she did get a, she you know, joined a repatriation train to Prague um, in, I believe it was the fall of 1945 or the summer. And she found no one alive. None of her family members, I believe uh, maybe one aunt um, did survive and also an uncle who had immigrated to England um, before, before the war began. So he, he escaped the Holocaust um, by, by living in England during this time. Um, but they married, um, and this is, I, I love this, this, this portrait. Um, you know, they didn't have anything you know, my grandmother wore a coat that she borrowed. It's a fur coat though, she always said. And my grandfather looks very smart in his uniform. And, uh, you know, they, they do have a number of photos of life kind of in that immediate aftermath of, of the war. And they're very, you know, they're, they're beautiful photos and they're, you know, they're a young couple in love and starting their, their lives together. But I also look at their faces and I, I do see a sadness and I do see, you know, the loss that they were experiencing. Um, you know, my grandmother had been, you know, a brilliant student. Her family wanted her to become a doctor and she never even attended high school or, you know, was able to finish high school as a result of what they went through, let alone, you know, the actual, you know, loss of, of family and, you know, everything they had known. Um, but one thing that we do have is our photos and partly, partly why we have a lot of the photos, especially of pre-war life 
Um, my grandmother's old old nanny, um, Annie, the woman who was uh, working for my 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 great grandmother, um, she did keep a lot of photographs and other family objects for my my grandmother. Um, and so, you know, she is someone who she doesn't have the title of righteous among the nations or anything like that. But I definitely think of her as someone who, you know, truly loved my family and, and you know, tried to do right by them in whatever way she could. And my grandmother, again, was in touch with her throughout the rest of her life. And I believe my grandmother actually heard my grandfather. They tried to get her at one point to immigrate to Canada, but she was also living under communism. Um, and that was another obstacle uh, for quite a while. And then also her age. But, and, uh, and so my grandparents um, had their first child, Peter, a son in 1948, and he was born in Prague. Um, but it was fairly shortly after uh, Peter was born, or I believe about a year after Peter was born, uh, that they did finally um, make Aliyah and they, they journeyed to Israel. <clears throat> and that's another entire chapter of their journey. And it definitely, um, you know, the, the photos that, that they have of that time are, are also incredible because, you know, you get a sense of this, you know, their, their community, many of, of the people around them are also survivors and, you know, in various states of trauma and, and, and uh, you know, in physical shape and whatever. Um, and also a lot of just like the difficulties that, that they faced, um, you know, living in this sort of, in these conditions at, at a time where, uh, you know, it was pretty rough, especially in the area they were. So on the left side, this is actually a, an image of the house um, that they lived in when they first moved there and different images of life, you know, in their community. And, and you can also see some, uh, the, the little boy in, in this picture on the lower left, that's my uncle Peter. And then uh, also he's the small child um, on the top right there. And my grandfather is standing behind him. And here are just a few more scenes from, from life. And, you know, it was, it was, I think a beautiful time for them, but also very difficult. Um, and they, they did have a second child who died of polio and I'm not sure, but I, I believe that probably played a role in, in shaping their decision to leave uh, Israel and, and to travel uh, and immigrate to Canada. And this was possible um, largely because of this man right here. So he was my, my, my great grandfather, Maximilian Federer, his younger brother, Otto. I mentioned that he had moved to England before the war began. So he, I believe, had a, an import export business and worked in England. And then after, uh, after World War II, immigrated to Canada um, and lived at least for a time in a schoolhouse in, in uh, a village called Spencerville, Ontario. It's about 40 minutes south of Ottawa. And here are some scenes from his life. He's got he has a lot of photos and very, uh, a wonderful eccentric man, um, but he was the one who sponsored my grandparents and allowed, allowed them to make the journey to Canada and they, they arrived in 1952. And at this point, I, you know, I, I, I could show you many more photos, but I, I won't. And just, you know, to get a sense of their life, they, they, they then, when they arrived in Canada, had, had two more children, my mother, Lynn Steiner and uh, also my uncle David um, and built an incredible life for themselves here. My grandfather became, uh, he worked as a, an engineer at an electrical plant in the town of Prescott um, and my grandmother became uh, the main librarian in Prescott and held that role for more than 30 years and definitely always proved to me that, you know, you don't really need an education to be educated if you are curious and you know, willing to, willing to explore the world. Um, and here's one little photo just of me, my sister, my mother and, and grandparents. I was very lucky that when I was about 13, I went with them to Prague and they were able to show us, you know, a lot of their old sites and, you know, the synagogue they attended, um, or they actually attended two different synagogues as children and just, you know, where their families had lived and everything like that. 
And I, I feel like incredibly lucky that I had that experience. Um, and I realize that there's only a few minutes left really at this point. Um, I will just say that there was an incredible opportunity. Um, I wasn't here for this, but my mother and my uncle Peter were able to travel with my grandmother to Israel in, I think it was, yeah, 2012. Thank you for, to me for putting the date on there. Um, and it was all basically uh, organized by the woman whose who's quote I read earlier, uh, Yudita Matyasova, who wrote, she was a Czech journalist who wrote a book um, and the English translation of the title is Friendship in Spite of Hitler. And so this is a book again about about the Czech teenagers and their journey, um, as well as what they lost along the way. Um, and you know, this was a really special opportunity at a reunion with uh, you know, the remaining survivors. I believe there were six of them that were still living. And you know, they hadn't seen each other in some cases for 70 years. So it was a really beautiful reunion. And uh, I hope, and I think it was a very healing experience as well. And with that all said, I'm gonna stop myself, but thank you so much for listening. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions people might have and turn it back over to Daniela now. Elena, thank you so much. I mean, for all of you, I've been fortunate to work with Elena for the last, I think it's five plus years as a teaching partner. Um, we're very, very close. I learned things I'd never known as well. You're a fantastic storyteller, the way you evoke the emotions and tell the stories and you know your own personality, of course, shines through as well. It's an absolute honor to be able to hear your, your grandparents and your, your family story, it really is. Thank you so um, much. And I know Michael wanted to say a few words as well. So for all of you on the call, I'll introduce to you Michael Levitt as well. Hello everyone and, and uh, Daniela, uh, uh, sorry, Elena, that was um, amazing. <laughs> So, so great to be able to come and, and uh, um, congratulate a team member at FSWC for delivering such a wonderful talk and for taking us inside your family's history and, and um, sharing you know, their story, their, their, uh, their adventure and their testimony with us. Um, and you know, it certainly was the fact that they were able to document and have so many images and, and uh, photos and, and that it's been passed down so in, in such detail. Um, we know because we deal with testimony every day um, how lucky you are, and I guess now today how lucky all of us are to be able to share that with you. So um, thank you for taking us on that journey. And uh, I echo Daniela, you know, we, we, we're, we're lucky enough to work with you every day, but especially on, on a day like this, uh, it comes home just uh, what a what a great um, and voluble member of the team you are. So um, I, I just want to say uh, thank you to Daniela, to all our education team. I know I see Melissa and Ariel and, and whoever else may be on the, the, the line today. I also see um, at least some of uh, the survivors that we're um, honored and privileged to work with every day. I see Hedy was here. I see Andy was here. I don't know who else I was trying to to, to go through quickly and, and see who else might be on. But we really, um, uh, we are really so privileged at, at FSWC to be able to spend time and learn every day from the testimonies, uh, whether it's of Holocaust survivors or um, other individuals who have, again, prevailed against the, you know, sometimes the worst of conditions, but are able to come on and, and share with us, uh, you know, the, the, the path that they've taken or to hear their families, you know, take us through that, th those, uh, those stories as well. Um, and of course, as I do every time, thank you to all of you. Ah, before I do that, thank you to the Wallenberg Center, the Ruhl Wallenberg Center for being our partner in this program every two weeks. Daniela, do we have another one before we break for summer or is this the last? So no, I was gonna make that announcement as well. Oh. This is actually our penultimate one for the summer. Um, we're going on hiatus to give for summer break. And then in the meantime, we're working ahead to bring you all brand new survivors and speakers and testimony in September. And, and, and I will add, Daniela is gonna be incredibly busy over the summer because our, we're expecting our second Tour for Humanity bus to be delivered uh, in the next month. Uh, so uh, we're going to be out on the road over the summer. I know we've got bookings at summer camps and other places. Um, again, it, it, it doesn't stop with the end of the school year, 
but uh, to, to all of you, um, thank you. I know I see so many uh, of you that tune in every couple of weeks and then every time, whether it was the dressmakers of Auschwitz and the other presentations that we do, we've really ramped up um, beyond just the conversation with a survivor series. We've ramped up um, the content that we're bringing, the programming that we're bringing, because we just get so much demand and so much appreciation after we put these sessions on that we're just gonna keep looking for interesting new opportunities. And of course, now the world's getting a little bit back to normal, we'll start doing them in person too. So thank you to all of you that are supporters of our organization in whatever form that takes. Um, we appreciate you, we appreciate you um, sharing your time with us because we know the demands that are out there and we know how busy you all are. Um, and with that, I won't ramble on anymore. I'll put it back to Daniela. But uh, if we don't see you again, I guess virtually or otherwise for the summer, wishing you all a, a safe, healthy um, and productive and relaxing summer. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And again, thank you, everybody. I echo what Michael said as well. We appreciate you joining us week after week. Um, we hope you'll join us again in September. You'll be hearing from me, of course, as well with upcoming programming for speaker series and things like that. Elena, again, thank you so much for presenting and for sharing all of this today. Um, wishing everyone a wonderful evening.